welcome to Lynn Ulbrich and the Free Ross Initiative. Well, as Carmen said, my son, Ross, is serving a double life sentence plus 40 years without the possibility of parole for all nonviolent charges. He's a first time offender. He has no history of violence at all. No one's ever accused him of inflicting any kind of physical harm on anyone. He is a danger to no one. So you, you think, well, wait a second. You know, how many people did he murder? Oh, no, none. How many buildings did he blow up? Uh, oh, yeah, right, none. How many children did he traffic? None. He's in there for a website. He's in there. He's got life sentence for a website that um, was essentially private and um, used Bitcoin as the means of exchange only, only Bitcoin. And because of that, um, well, first let me say, um, he was put in a maximum security prison because of this life sentence, which is a very dangerous place, and I'm gonna talk about that later. But um, because um, the site was ran, ran on Bitcoin only, Ross has been called the second most important person in Bitcoin history after Satoshi. A lot of people have told me that. And it's because it proved that Bitcoin could actually be used as money. And it put it on the map. Before that, it was essentially the plaything of geeks. And I think it's a very good possibility that no one would have really heard of it without Silk Road. And I believe it was the, this upstart currency that John McAfee made the very good um, case that it was very, it's very threatening. It's very threatening to the financial powers. And I believe that is why they came down so hard on, on my son. And just a little overview of Silk Road. Um, here are some of the things that were sold on Silk Road. There were plenty of legal items. It was like eBay in a lot of ways. So you can see books and uh, electronics and jewelry and a lot of things. Um, these were not allowed to be mentioned at trial. Um, and it was based strictly on the non-aggression principle. So this, the top part is a, um, an image from the exhibits at trial, but basically the seller's guide said, nothing that harmed a third party was allowed. Nothing related to pedophilia or child pornography was allowed. No stolen property, no violence, etc. cetera. And um, so again, why would they come down so hard on Ross? I think it's the Bitcoin. Now people say that Bitcoin's a scam or Bitcoin's currency or Bitcoin's a store of value. And I would suggest that Bitcoin is an idea as well. Bitcoin is an idea. It's a philosophy. And uh, it's a very revolutionary idea. And um, as Ross writes, I don't know if I'm at where I am in this. Oh yeah, sorry. Bitcoin equals freedom. He wrote this in an essay called Bitcoin Equals Freedom. And um, of the early adopters, this is what he wrote. They dreamed of a future where the economic power of the world is accessible to everyone, where value can be transferred anywhere with a keystroke. And they dreamed of prosperity and freedom. That's the undermining force behind Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And again, I believe it is why they came down so hard on Ross. And the, 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 from this quote, you can see that the judge knew, knew that. She, this is from the sentencing transcript. And she said, it's notable that the reasons you started this site, Silk Road, were philosophical. And I don't know that this is a philosophy left behind. In other words, well, you might not have dropped this really dangerous and troubling philosophy, that the, her words, so I'm going to have to put you in a cage for the rest of your life because that's just too threatening. We're not supposed to be caged for our philosophy. We're not supposed to be caged for our political views. 
And it's something we, everybody in here needs to really pay attention to. That's what they were afraid of. Ross also wrote in another essay, um, in uh, Bitcoin Magazine published it in their 10th anniversary. Uh, it was called Happy Birthday Bitcoin. And um, he talks about how the technology can repair injustices and revolutionize the globe into a more equitable society where, um, you know, everybody has a chance. And um, in it he says, I'll just read from the, um, a little bit from it. Bitcoin, Bitcoin needs us to continue guiding it with the values it was founded on that gave it its potential. We must keep our focus on decentralization, privacy, and empowering individuals. It's a technology with the power to make abstractions like peace and equality into reality. But it's up to us to embody such ideals and be role models for the ever-growing Bitcoin community and for Bitcoin itself. Two million, two billion, excuse me, people in the world are unbanked. They can't even, they don't have access to, to being able to start businesses or have a house and all of this and that, um, and Bitcoin can provide that. Um, I was just recently at a conference called the Black Blockchain Conference in DC and a lot of people from Africa were there and they're trying to bring this to Africa because it will give so many people the opportunity that we have through cryptocurrency. Again, very threatening to the powers that be and why the government went after Ross so hard, I believe. And I, I was very convinced. I wasn't sure, you know, I thought, oh, well, it's a drug case, blah, blah, blah. And then I saw the other um, the defendants in the case and what sentences they got. So this is a chart and you can see their sentences. It ranges from 10 years to no time. Uh, Jan Slomp was convicted of being the biggest drug seller on Silk Road. He has the same offense level as Ross, got 10 years. Um, the two corrupt agents, there were two corrupt agents involved in the case. They went to prison for stealing and potentially changing things on the site that were used as evidence. And uh, there it's six years, eight years. And then there was a copycat site called Silk Road 2 that the government said was bigger it was identical, but bigger. Sold more drugs. The guy running that, Blake Benthal, he was in for 13 days. He has no sentence. He never went to trial. And now it's, it was discovered by Vice that he's, what he has to do is he has to pay back taxes for two years. He's essentially equivalent to Ross. And Ross got double life plus 40. But then again, Ross came up with a really dangerous idea. Uh, here, it, this is just from the Bureau of Prisons, just to show you Ross's, um, official listing there, release date, it says life, it should say death. He's been given a walking death sentence for this. And Blake Banthal, well he was released November 2014, 13 days after his arrest. I think it also it came out uh, f about a year ago, Snowden papers revealed, The Intercept published it, that the government was very, very concerned about Bitcoin when um, the Silk Road, you know, became known. And the NSA, the full power of the government, and the NSA was urgently tracking Bitcoin users a few months before Ross's arrest and the Silk Road was taken down. They're supposed to be going after terrorists and protecting us. They're, they're more worried about people using cryptocurrency than terrorists, apparently. There's so much to this story. There's so much that's wrong. Um, I mentioned the corrupt agents. These guys had keys to the kingdom. They could go in there and not only steal money from vendors, but change passwords, keys. They could act as DPR, the lead investigator, uh, and other aliases. Totally tainted the evidence, and it was allowed to be used at trial. There's lots of, um, oh, and there, then after trial it came out that probably a ro another rogue agent deleted evidence that would have potentially exonerated Ross. It also came out that DPR, after Ross's uh, trial, when he was in solitary, logged into Silk Road. 
I mean, there's lots of anecdotal as well as hard evidence that there were many administrators, but they wanted their trophy. They wanted to say, we got the guy, and Ross is serving life for what everyone did on the site um, or didn't do. There's also, and I'm, you may, if you're familiar with the case, have heard that Ross was uh, accused by the government of arranging murder for hire, but then when it came to c bringing charges in court, they didn't have those charges. They dropped them, and, um, and, and yet the judge used them, uncharged allegations, to justify her sentence. Later, another indictment that mentioned them has been a uh, drop with prejudice. No charges at all exist, and yet the, the judge used it to justify her sentence, and apparently this is done in our country. You don't have to, you can be acquitted, you could not even be charged like Ross, and a judge can say, well, I'm more important than a jury, and I decide it's true. I think it's true, so I'm gonna put you away. And we challenge this all the way up to the Supreme Court, because it's a um, violation of the Sixth Amendment, right to be judged by a jury of your peers. And they didn't seem to care about it. So we have, there, it's so complicated, I can't go into a lot of the, the case or anything. Oh, and here's another thing showing, this was written about that it was the murder for hire charges were dropped. So we have something called railroaded on our site, and it's, if you wanna dive deep, you can go there, you can listen to it, it's a podcast now, as well as written out, it's totally based on the public record. I would love to be able to have other citations like all the encrypted and um, sealed evidence the government refuses to release about this case. We didn't, but even with the, um, the, ac the public record, it's pretty jaw-dropping. And we're calling it railroaded, because Ross was railroaded right into a maximum security prison. Here he is with his uh, fellow prisoners at, in Florence, Colorado. Uh, all of them nonviolent drug sellers or, or offenders serving life sentences. Nonviolent drug offenders serving life. So, for instance, um, and I know that, I, I've met several of them, I've, I'm in touch with their families and other people in there. For instance, Tony, who is um, third from the left at standing, he is serving life for marijuana. Marijuana, the prison happens to be in Colorado, but it's federal, in a federal compound. Guy's serving life, he's already done 15 years. Um, the guy, Jose, who's um, far right kneeling, he's, his th it was a third strike, which is this terribly evil law, that his third strike was residue on a dollar bill. He's serving life, essentially, for residue on a dollar bill. This is what our criminal justice system is doing to people. And they're making tons of money off of it, and they're shredding our rights. And so, as people who believe in and care about freedom, we really should care about what's going on in the criminal justice system. And they're building lots of prisons. I mean, you know, we all could be, you know, there's a book, Three Felonies a Day. We all could be thrown in there, literally can. Here I am visiting Ross in, in Florence. Behind me is a sniper tower, one of many, and uh, three la layers of razor wire. Um, he, his security score puts him in a camp and they put him in there because of his sentence, and he had to contend with violent gangs, uh, dangerous people. There were stabbings, there were beatings, pretty serious stuff, to say the least. Um, he refused to participate in an assault on another inmate, which made him a target. He was put in uh, protective custody where he was kept in a five, what is it, eight by 10 metal box with no window for three and a half months, and then he was thankfully moved to another maximum security prison, but one, they put people who are targeted, and so he's safe at least, he's safe. He, he was living on the edge of every minute, is someone gonna come up and stab me? Is some, I mean, it's that kind of environment. He managed it. Um, so here I am in a creepily similar place. Uh, I did a, a, a speaker series in Eastern Europe, and this is Auschwitz. This is um, the German concentration camp, Auschwitz. It is a very sobering experience to be there. And I overheard a tour guide say to his group, he said, 
The lesson here is watch your politicians. This wasn't that long ago. There's people still alive who remember Auschwitz. And of course there's, you know, look at North Korea. I mean, there's, this is going on now. But what I would say is for us, watch our government. This is happening now in the United States. Here's what's happened to the prison population since the war on drugs. It's metastasized 800%. They're just putting people in there, building more prisons. This is mass incarceration, huge moneymaker, and again, shredding our rights in the process. If the prison population were a state, it's bigger than 11 states. It, it's its own state. They do this with life sentences like Ross's, which have quintupled since the 80s. So they, there are over 17,000 non-violent, never hurt anybody, people serving life. So here we are, number one incarcerator in the world, um, land of the free. This is serious. This is really, really horrible. What's going on? I've gotten to know the families. I see the children going in there and seeing their fathers clinging to them and then leaving shattered, sobbing, harmed. And the statistics show that they will probably go into the system. They will feed the mass incarceration monster and it will continue multi-generational. This is un-American, plain and simple. This wasn't happening before the drug war and it needs to stop. Um, you know, after 45 years and over a billion dollars, I think it's pretty well established that the drug war doesn't work except for the people who are making tons of money, but it works great for them. I mean, seriously, even the government knows that, it, you know, that they're even as inefficient and as they are, it's working really well for them. They know it doesn't work to stop drug use, but they, it's working quite well if, if what you want to do is control people and throw them in prison and make a lot of money. So here's a picture of Ross before, now he's in prison, after. He's getting older, you know, we all are. Um, he's 35 now. He was 26 when he started Silk Road, created it. Um, so like thousands of others, he's growing older in, in there. His life is being wasted. He has so much to give. I would so love to see him here with all of you. He would love it. He'd, he'd be having so much fun. And uh, he's no threat to anybody. And you know his family's being deprived, as are all these other people's, plus society, plus all of us. It's a huge human waste, as well as financial, because it'll cost over $2 million to keep Ross in prison for his lifetime. But hopefully that will not happen. Um, so I want to read just one more thing he wrote, because he wrote, he's written about the prison experience and what prison is. And he wrote an um, essay called um, Who Deserves This? And um, he's, he's really talking about how our system now is, is based on vengeance and punishment. They call it corrective. That's the biggest joke. It's, it, it's a criminal training ground is what it is but it's also punishment, it's about vengeance. And he said, I can prove to you it's torture because he went around and talked to a bunch of fellow prisoners and said, okay, which would you choose? For a finite time being tortured, like you know, horrible physical torture, or this endless time in prison, which would you pick? They all picked torture. I'll just tough it out for however long and get out of here. So um, he wrote, vengeance, and this is handwriting. He was working on his penmanship, by the way. <laughs> he got a book on it because he, he can't type. So anyway, it's gotten a lot better. Um, <laughs> vengeance and cruelty are not aspects of our nature to be honored and institutionalized. They are base and destructive. They hurt all parties. Our families and communities are hurting. Humanity is hurting. The pain of your fellow human being is your pain, too, even though it's locked away in remote prisons. We can do better. We have the potential to rise above the darkness, to be proud of how humanely we treat prisoners and how few we need to brand with that label. Instead, we hand out years, decades, and lifetimes of imprisonment to virtually every person the government targets, 
We keep building cells like the one I'm writing this from. And he concludes saying, prisoners are not inventory. We are not numbers or statistics. We are human beings and we don't deserve this. I've learned a lot about our criminal justice system up close and personal from this experience fighting for my son. And um, I've learned um, that it's not necessary. I mean, yes, there are some people society needs to be protected from, but there are so many that we could treat this in a more enlightened way um, and a lot less expensive way in so many ways. Um, so I would suggest to you, this is an important case. I mean, it's, it's important for cryptocurrency. People are being put in jail for cryptocurrency, various things related to cryptocurrency. It's important for sentencing ex excessiveness and what we're doing to our people. Um, I really encourage you to not forget Ross and not forget the people in prison and to, I know you guys will, you know, keep fighting for freedom because I believe it's, we're losing our freedoms. We're at a tipping point in history. And, you know, it's, we're kind of at this crossroads. We're gonna either go down the road of more government intrusion and control and, and uh, surveillance, or we're gonna go towards innovation and change and all the things that we've been talking about here but we're really at a tipping point, and you know, we've got to push it over to the good side. It's gonna be hard, <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, in Ross's case, being high profile sets a precedent. Uh, I'm working hard to try to get the attention of the president to have him see that this sets a terrible example for excessive sentencing, and so that, that brings me to our petition just go to freeross.org or freeross.org slash petition. We have over 206,000 signers already in a year. I'm going for uh, at least 250, because then I can say quarter of a million. I really like that million, you know. And um, just to say, look, this many people care about this. This sets a horrible precedent for what's going on in our country. Um, so, you know, while we're all enjoying this and enjoying our freedom, Ross is a real person who's fighting for his life, fighting to get out of that cage. And um, so, any way you can help me spread the word about the petition, um, anybody who has any contacts in the government, please get a hold of me. Go to freeross.org. Every footer has my, you can click to get a hold of me. It's really easy to get a hold of me. Um, of course, we always need People have been very kind to donate. It's really expensive to fight the government. <laughs> it's just endlessly expensive. And I also want to invite you to join us with, with something that Clive brought up that was, we are having every evening, 7 p.m. Pacific to 10 p.m. Eastern, people are taking a second to visualize Ross free. We're doing it together. I set my alarm on my phone and I invite you to join us. I believe that. I believe that if enough people are visualizing Ross Free, praying for that, however, you know, just seeing it a reality, we can make it real. He can come out and help fight for what we're all fighting for. So I really appreciate your support and um, for hearing about Ross. Thank you. <laughs>